So, um, I have some crazy news, which I haven't really been able to talk about till now. Potentially, tomorrow, I'm going to explain why I say potentially in a bit. I might have just organised Greg Sestero to come to our university. And if you don't know who Greg Sestero is... I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hey, Johnny. What's up? I have a problem with Lisa. She said that I hit her. <sighs> what? Haha. <laughs> That's my boy Greg. So, you know, I was a big fan of The Room back in the day. I had my own meme society. I, I showed The Room to like 30 students or whatever. I, I just got bored one day and decided to email the people organizing the events for Best Friends, which is the new movie by Greg Sestero. And I, I wanted to try and get them to come to my university. I basically thought this would no way happen. Because I mean, come on, why why would they fly in from America to come to to come to my university? Because I told them to. I did it anyway. That happened in October, and come by January first, I got the email that changed everything. I should have an update soon, but February sixteenth should work. That got me excited. I was like, Jesus Christ, Tommy and Greg, they come to my university. I need to make sure I can get like, 300 people to come to this event. I, I need to accommodate them, make sure everyone get, arrives on time, get them a hotel, everything. Everything's got to be snaparoo. But then, weeks passed, I wouldn't really get great replies. I would send massive emails like, hey, can you tell me details of, like, how you're traveling here? What what, what do I have to pay for? Exa and everything. And they wouldn't really let me know. It came to a point where I decided I need to get on the phone with these guys because it's three weeks till the event and I need to find out what is going on. So, I gave a little tiny phone call, and it was interesting, uh, to say the least. All right, should I play it? Hello? Hi there, am I speaking with Daphne? Yes, you're speaking to Daphne. So, Daphne was the person I was on the phone to, and um, they were an interesting person. They seemed to not have a clue at what was going on. And this was three weeks before the event had started. This is, we had no advertising done. We hadn't sold any tickets. This was supposed to be the final confirmation of everything. But once this phone call happened, we were, we were very scared. Have you started kind of looking at routing and how you're going to get down? Or do you want me to suggest some ideas? Well, uh, how about if you suggest some ideas, Stefan? This was uh, my, my friend Hadley speaking. He runs kind of the event management at my university. And multiple times in this conversation, uh, he was like, uh, you're speaking to Hadley, by the way. Stefan is, is the student running the event. And every time he would answer back, we're like, Stefan, what do you think about this? And I was just like, all right, you didn't listen, did you? Look at, uh, we could even look at a train, um, or we could look at a, uh, like a private transfer. I think that the easiest transportation Oh, thanks, Daphne. <laughs> it has, has a long little think, and he's like, the easiest one. I think we have, at, at that point, um, Hadley whispers to me, is this for real? I think is what he says. I was like, I honestly can't tell you. The easiest way is better. It, no, he's not wrong. He has, he has some good points there. He just explained us uh, what a car does, which I find brilliant. Thank you. They probably weren't put in a position of, you know, organizing an event like this before. I, re I reckon they're used to other venues knowing what they're doing. And this was the first time for us as well. So us asking all these questions, they, they didn't know what was happening. So that's understandable. Last question that we wanted to ask, actually, is regards to, um, so when the day has ended, um, we have a bit of like a, a party with all of the students in the bar at night time. Um, and we were wondering if um, Tommy and Greg would like, or either of them would like to do maybe a little DJ set or something, if they've ever done that before. No. But so they go out. Yeah. And what happens in that bar? How many students? Uh, we'd expect to have about 200. 200 students, okay. Yes. Would they all be drunk? Uh... <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. No, Stefan, thank you. We are uh, flattered that you want to, uh, to welcome us and show our work. So thank you to you, Stefan.
Great. I appreciate it, Daphne. Th- thanks to you too, man. That conversation was interesting. At that point, it was it was, it was pretty scary because we had nothing organised and clearly, clearly nothing had been resolved. I, I got told to cancel the event, basically, by my student union after this phone call because they were like, this, this is quite shifty. Uh, you don't want this to be a thing where you sell loads of tickets and you promise people things and then last minute, Greg... And Tommy don't turn up. And I decided I'm not going to listen to them. And then guess what happened the next week after that? Tommy cancelled two weeks before the event. I emailed them saying, how can you cancel Tommy? Like, if you cancel Tommy, why, w- what's stopping Greg from not coming and you cancelling last minute? We need some sort of contract. And then they were like, oh, we, we, we 99% knew that Tommy wouldn't come. But uh, with Greg, we give you our word. And I was like, what what does that mean? <laughs> How can we trust that? I was putting my money on the line and my reputation on the line. I still went on the with, with the event with just Greg Sestero. I had advertised, put banners everywhere. It's now the day before the event. I have no idea if this is gonna go to plan. This could be Fire Festival 2. This could just be terrible and I have a load of angry students coming at me. I guess we're gonna find out tomorrow. I am so stressed out. Please come, Greg. Please. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow uh, where we find out if this actually goes down. He's gonna be here in about two minutes. So, this is happening. (laughs) This is gonna be crazy. Okay. I was actually afraid you wouldn't come, Greg, Be- just because of the whole organisation <laughs> thing. I was genuinely, I was genuinely worried. I made a whole like conspiracy theory, basically, because um, it was like a whole joke. Yeah, basically, I didn't know if it was real. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly, I remember back when the room was made, Tommy put his own phone number on billboards. Uh, I remember to like organise like screenings of the room, he would do it himself, wouldn't he? So I was, I was thinking, could it possibly be Tommy under a different name for all these e- emails? It sounded like Tommy through the phone. It uh, genuinely, it sounded like Tommy. And I don't know if you know anything about that or if this uh, actual conspiracy theory that Tommy's behind organising this. <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> I was definitely worried, but I'm I'm glad this has happened, and I'm quite thankful. Makes it more dramatic. Yeah, worried up to the point where I actually saw you like, get off the bus. Or yeah, fine. Now you're, now you're making me feel like I could have really done something fun. <laughs> I would have totally messed with you. <laughs> I would have gone like really creepy and be like, "Can I be honest? This is a Greg, but I can see you." But I can pretend to be Greg. <laughs> Yeah. Come through with me, mate. I'll take you through with me. Should I do an intro? Like, welcome Tommy to the stage. I mean, Greg to the stage. <laughs> Taking bets on the first time that was going to happen. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Are you ready for the event of your life? Yeah. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. My first time in Farnham, and I gotta say, it's quite lovely. <laughs> As you can imagine, it took me about 15 years to get up the courage to work with Tommy again. <laughs> I never expected to work with Tommy again, but late one night, I had an edible. <laughs> I got this crazy idea to write a script for Tommy and I to do another movie, and I thought about this road trip that we took years ago, in which he thought I was taking him on a drive to try to kill him. <laughs> so I started writing with that, and uh, in four days I had the whole story, and I was like, there's no way he's gonna play this character, because this character's like this vampire mortician guy. It's completely insane. And I pitched it to him, and Tommy's like, yeah, sure we can. <laughs> I have one request. And it's like, it's gonna be that he wants to like, rewrite the script, shoot it in Transylvania. <laughs> it's like, what about if you and I are same height in room? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know why he wanted that, or how it was gonna be accomplished, but I said, sure. <laughs> so we went and had these platform heels made for him. <laughs> And he shows up walking like Frankenstein. He's like, pretty nice, huh? 
But you cannot show my shoes in the movie at all. Only shoot me from this angle. He's like, yeah, sure. So when you see his character, you're going to get a good laugh because the shoes make a, a, an entrance pretty much in every scene he's in. So, uh, uh, you guys are in for the weirdest double feature of your life, and uh, I will see you guys after part one. And uh, just make sure you keep an open mind. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. And when you were filming like best friends and stuff, did Tommy ever like try to control the shoot? Not really. Not really. You, it was easy to much, control. Yeah, he pretty much showed up and was like, "All right, I'll do it this way." Seems like a character that was kind of written specifically for him in mind. Kind yeah. Of off settling. Yeah, know. and that's why it was great because he could just kind of be himself. Yeah, I think so he tried to change him. He'd make a fabulous banker. <laughs> <laughs> Not wanker, but banker. <laughs> Is it on video? Please welcome thanks to stage three crew and Greg Sestero. And also a massive, massive hand to Stefan, who's put all of this together himself, by the way, and made all of this possible. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, it's amazing actually having you here, first of all, because I honestly didn't think that you would actually come. <laughs> yeah, it was a... I thought about showing up dressed as Tommy and saying, I'm sorry, uh, Greg is not feeling well today. <laughs> Can, can you answer a few questions in Tommy's voice? We, we, we can try, let's not plan too much right now. <laughs> Tell us the story about, you know, the filming of Best Friends. But the movie was a lot of fun to make. I think um, the cliff scene was probably the most interesting to me. Because it's not every day in life you get to act out a dark fantasy your friend has about you that you thought you were going to try to kill him. And then we actually really go and do it. Um, and I thought that his acting was really interesting that day because he didn't forget his lines, he was very in the moment. His <laughs> improvs made sense to the story. Uh, so it was, uh, really making this film was, obviously it was immensely challenging because the story is really out there and I had to find these locations that shouldn't exist but do. And, um, and working with Tommy this time around was really interesting. So um, you say you went on a road trip with Tommy, and then he thought he was gonna, you were gonna kill him. Why? Why did he go in the first place? <laughs> so he got the idea. We were driving up to Bodega Bay, where Hitchcock shot the birds. I feel like our friendship is just like one twisted Hitchcock story. <laughs> so this was just a chapter in that story. And so we were going up to Bodega Bay on a road trip. And for anybody that's been up to California and driven up Highway 1, it's really windy and really foggy. So I figured, let's stay up here the night and we'll drive back the next day. Uh, so there was this small little hotel in this town. There was one room left. And I just thought it'd be easier if I went in and got the room and Tommy stayed behind because I felt like if we both went in there, the guy would probably think we're going to do drugs in there for like the next 60 hours. So I just told him to meet me around the back and I'd get the room and then he thought that I was doing that so he wouldn't be seen by the cameras or whatever, by the person, and that I was going to kill him in the hotel room. Really, I just wanted to go to sleep, but uh, he really believed this because he brought it up several times over the years. And I was like, dude, okay, so let me think about what would I have done if I really tried to kill him and how would it work. And so that's how the script all came together. And you guys are about to see in volume two how I thought the fantasy would play out. Does he die? Does he come back? All that stuff. I mean, how would you even plan to kill Tommy? I don't think you can. <laughs> That's the point of these movies. <laughs> It's incredible that, that you know you guys are so widely known because you know the disaster artists now, and I think the fact that even at university they, they teach us about the room as a as an amazing cult movie that will go down in history. How do you feel about that? About being so well known for that? Well, I think I've come to appreciate the room not for the film that it is, because um, I've only seen it like three times. But I think uh, it teaches you that really in film nobody knows anything. Because technically it does everything wrong, but like, you're showing film students Citizen Kane and other classic films, and then you put the room on and there's immediate laughter and they're engaged throughout the film because it does everything wrong, yet you're interested to see where the hell is this going to go, who made it, for what purpose. And uh, I think that's what a film should do. And it goes to show there no, there's no rules, really. I mean, you have an idea of what makes a film great. You know, like I can watch Sunset Boulevard over and over because the acting's amazing, the characters are great. And that's what you strive for, you know? Or Back to the Future, a movie that 
has plants and pays off and is fun and is original. But um, you know, when we conceive a film in our minds, we don't know. We think it's great, but we don't know how it's going to play out. And I think that the beauty is in the execution. And I think the room was a disaster, but at the same time, here we are, 16 years later. It it it, it draws in a young crowd, which is not easy to do. Um, and so I think it's just something that has been fascinating to study. You know, the film is what it is. It's not going to get you acting work. You got to find a way to to make it um, an interesting experience. But for me, it's it's taught me a lot. Uh, what has kept like you and Tommy together then? Because over over the years, what do, do you do it for? Basically, you know, the nostalgia, or uh, or do you, do you enjoy working with him? Yeah, well, we got married and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. It's um, it's just something we both have a creative dream, and I think the room is like the child that's kept us uh, connected. Um, and I think as friends, we kind of brought out in each other what we both don't have, and I think that can be a powerful thing. Because a lot of times you have buddies that you can go watch soccer with at the pub, and you can hang out and have a great time. And then there's friends that kind of push you into places you don't want to go and that challenge you, and that's where you grow the most. And I think that's kind of what Tommy and I represent to each other, is we help each other get, get to the place we want it to be in a very twisted way, but it creates a connection that's, that, that lasts a long time, and I think um, opposites attract, maybe. How self-aware do you think Tommy is? I don't know if that sounds rude or anything. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, I think he's, as genuine as you think he would be, I think the room was something that he thought was going to be an incredible drama that people would cry. Uh, he told me, you know, people when they see this project, they will not sleep for two weeks. Johnny will kill himself in front of an entire world. And what about that Hollywood? Uh, and that's just something that I think is what makes him unique. What's the most surreal experience you've had with Tommy in, in any set? There's never really a normal experience with him, but I think probably going to the Golden Globes was uh, 18 years after the night that we went to go see the talented Mr. Ripley, the night of the Golden Globes, and he said, this movie, you know, will change Hollywood, and then 18 years later, we're at the Golden Globes. For a book that I wrote about that experience, I think there was just something kind of magical and strange like it was almost meant to be, like the movie gods were like, let's just see how much you can endure to see what the story becomes. And I think um, it was probably that night. What's next for you guys, actually? So at the moment, I'm writing a, uh, a horror film about a, a cult living in the Arizona desert. So um, if you guys like true crime and crazy films like uh, The Babadook, It Follows, and Hereditary, um, Hopefully I'll have a good surprise for you guys. Uh, being in Hollywood, uh, you, 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 I'm assuming you know a few actors and uh, directors out there, so can you tell me your favorite and least favorite person out there? <laughs> I mean, I think everybody is, I love characters, so even if they're not perhaps the nicest, I still think it's intriguing. I had, you know, as much as I love the movie Fight Club, I had a, uh, a weird uh, incident with Ed Norton. I, I was trying to get into this party that the owner was letting me in. Ed Norton didn't want any more people. And unfortunately, he hadn't seen the room yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, other than that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's filled with creatives and at any moment, you know, they can throw a dash of weirdness. So you always got to be prepared. I, I mean, feel free to tell us a bit about kind of your childhood. So, um... <laughs> I don't really know much about, you know, where you, you, you were brought up and, like, did you go to acting school or, like, you know? It's, uh, I, you know, I ended up writing a book about all this, but, um, oh, okay. that was good. Uh, for filmmakers and people drawn to film, you know, I grew up um, loving movies, but it, the first movie that actually made me want to take action to try to do something creative was Home Alone. Um, I saw the movie Home Alone, and I went home and I didn't, and I wasn't alone, but I was trying to think of like what I wanted to do with this passion, and I decided to write a screenplay on this old video writer about a sequel to Home Alone in which 
he has an older friend that helps him fight off the bad guys in Walt Disney World where he gets lost on a plane and ends up at. And the bad guys are now janitors of Walt Disney World. And so there's a whole showdown at Disney World and I wrote a character for myself opposite Macaulay Culkin, and I'm not lying to you, I named this character Mark. <laughs> this is 1992, I wrote this character as Mark. Unbelievable. And uh, so I wrote the whole script and it was the most alive I'd ever felt. I was not a very good student, but when I wrote this script I felt so focused, so alive, I was able to find John Hughes' production company, um, drew up a whole letter and sent it to him, and uh, I got a letter back, obviously my wasn't going to get made, unfortunately. Um, but I sent me a, a handwritten note that said he was really impressed and to follow your dream. And so uh, that's when I knew I wanted to do something creative. But it was a great feeling to have that direction, you know, because for so long it's like I didn't love school. I, I was into sports, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And then Home Alone was like, okay, you're going to do something in the movies. Another movie you've been working on recently, uh, Tom, Tommy's released a trailer called Big Shark. And that's um, interesting because it's only uploaded 360p in 2019 on YouTube. But uh, it's going for like the Scorsese like film look. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the next Jobs. Okay. <laughs> Spielberg is not happy because he feels like you know it's now he has to make another Jobs because now people are going to think this is the definitive shark movie. <laughs> So it's it's been a stressful week. Final question is, uh, what would you you know what would you tell to people out there trying to make it in the industry, and what advice would you give them? I would say really the greatest time you're going to have is in the journey and in the um, in the in the creative process. You know when I look back, um, you know especially you know watching Volume Two. Um, I just I enjoyed the, the camaraderie of making the film and being on location and trying to make these scenes come to work and the stress that comes with it. Um, that's always to me the greatest reward because you're getting to you're at the rawest form of creating and I think that is that's better than anything else. You know I, I remember with the disaster artist it was the same kind of thing. It was like being at the coffee shop for eight hours and, and crafting the story and thinking what the scene is going to do and how the readers are going to feel when they read it and, and you know getting to go like to the award stuff and all that I remember feeling I mean it was exciting but there was a sort of emptiness that I thought would that I wouldn't feel it would be like I thought that was going to be the exciting time but really it was the journey like if I could go back those were the moments I don't want to relive is, is um, being in the thick of it so I think um, you know the best thing you can do is find you know, your group and, and each of you, whether you're writers or cinematographers, get together and just go out and, and try to make stuff and enjoy doing that and worry about everything else after. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Give a massive, massive cheer to this man over here. He's got all of his From me personally as well, really well done. Thank, thank you. you so much for um, for doing something and putting yourself out there and bringing this to the Students' Union. Thanks. <laughs> thank, thank you. Wait, what's your name? Tommy. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Very cool, guys. <laughs> Admitted that you sound mildly retarded. <laughs> Uncle Rick? Uncle Rick was interesting. Oh, yeah. oh strange. <laughs> He's a strange. He was a strange. What part? Incest. <laughs> <laughs> you knew he was so dodgy from the beginning. <laughs> Yo, what's up? If you thought that was the end of the video, I mean, you're wrong. Because uh, me, and, me and Greg now, we're bros, and he was like, Yo, Steph, want to hang out in Nottingham? Greg, have you ever heard of the place called Greg's? Two G's? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times, but I've never never been inside. It's, it's literally just uh, pastry, sausage rolls, and you know, stuff like that. I should go in there and try to order in my accent. So I'm, I'm Greg. <laughs> I always thought Greg's was like a car place. Chicken, Peter, you just a little chicken. Chip, 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 chip. How are you calling a chicken? Me and Greg here aren't breaking the law. You guys can be detained. <laughs> do they have like security there? Probably, yeah. <laughs> How do you feel, Greg? 
If you were to do like a blind taste taste test, you think you'd actually be able to tell the difference? Um, yeah, Greg just tried the sausage roll. Greg's sausage roll. What's it taste like? Pretty close to the Yeah. It tastes like pate. It does, yeah. It's alright, it's good. That's my review. How do you rate it out of 10? For a vegan sausage, I would say eight and a half. That's pretty good. What about for a regular sausage? It's pretty close. I mean, it's probably the best one I've ever tried. This is a certified Greg, Greg sausage. <laughs> Minus the G. Whoa, all right. And that was the video, everyone. So it happened. Honestly, that was such a crazy experience. The whole thing of it, I'm still kind of in shock. To be honest, I just want to thank Greg for being such a lovely down-to-earth guy. Thanks to the Nandos that you bought me as well, dude. If you're watching this, Greg, wish you the best of luck in the future. I know your horror film is going to be amazing and I completely support everything you do in the future. Thank you so much for hanging out in general and being such an inspirational guy. And um, for everyone who watched, Thank you for watching this far. Feel free to smash the subscribe button. I guess I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. What an epic video. Aww. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye.